section two, page nine. Diligence. Protect yourself from capital. The current cash on value tells you you're buying. to make sure that nothing's going to I this many times. If someone is buying this using the same well, many times they buy the actual business with all they, they, someone owns a pizza store. It's owned by the is own LLC that LLC purchase. They don't they, it's not this building is every building is owned to buy a piece of real estate. It, 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 it's building it now, 481. 481 Oakland, that owns 481 Oakland, and there's like nine partners. There's two ways to buy from that other LLC. Two LLCs are that are owned by the Records are concerned, city records are concerned. Who owns the building? The same exact owners yesterday. The sub of it are just other people. The problem with the idea of buying out individual partners, that LLC engaged the super, engaged the vendor, engaged the problem with them. Position as the person before. However, if you come into a building and you start from scratch, the only issue that could come want you is that there's a lien on the property itself. So if the left owner to fight with someone, potential, it's a very small chance it's going to come back to bite you. The actual issue with the property itself, then, you know, that, that only problem you can have is the problem with the property itself. Title insurance. Basis insurance. When the person said, here, I own 41 Oak Glen. Now you could own Someone knocks on the and says, you're in the building, please leave. What do you mean? I just bought it yesterday. H how are you proving what happened? Title insurance proves insurance. You'll give back the money that you paid for the building because they, they told you that, you that this is the correct owner now, and you have the right to buy it from this proper owner. It's a simple form that title insurance does. Title insurance actually goes down much deeper. What happens if people have claims on the building? Someone did a, a, a worker did work on the building and has a, a lien on the property. A it's called a mechanics lien. Certain people that do work on a building are able to make a claim to the building, not just to the previous owner. Sometimes if I hire somebody and that I own a building and I hire somebody and he has a problem, he could come to me for make a claim, a monetary claim, and he takes me to court if he wants the money. But he has nothing, he can't do anything else. Some certain claims, a person has the right to make a lien on the property. So a lien is and as you understand that normally is a mortgage. Someone buys a building for a million dollars, they take a $750,000 mortgage. There's a lien on the property for the $750,000. <clears> if someone else makes a claim after that, their second position, like a second mortgage. So let's say for 100,000, someone else has another claim on top of it, it's 50,000. There's $900,000 worth of claims. In a normal case, there's someone in the first position, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And if God forbid there was a default and had to sell the building, the building received back 775,000. The first 750 goes to the first claim, and the second claim only gets 25,000. The third claim gets wiped out. But this concept is why many banks do not like to give second mortgages or third mortgages, so on and so forth, because they're behind the first mortgage. If there's a problem, they could get potentially totally wiped out. On a home, there's home equity loans. Home equity loans are like a second mortgage. They give a second mortgage to a property. So you have a first position, and so in 99% of the cases, a building has one lien, the first mortgage, whatever the balance is, that's the lien on the building, 750,000, 800,000, 2 million, whatever the number is, there's nothing else. Very rare is there a second mortgage. And if the person has issues with different vendors, sometimes there could be a lien put on it. That's how 90% of the world, 90 plus percent of buildings would look like. However, a tax lien is, the only thing that comes before the mortgage is the tax lien. That means if there is a problem with the person does not owe, stop paying city taxes, 
than property taxes, then and let's say for thirty thousand dollars, in a case where there's a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar mortgage, and then later on he stops paying his taxes, and there's a thirty thousand dollar tax lien, property tax lien, that doesn't go second, that goes first. Even though it came later, came after the first the first mortgage, it goes before the first mortgage. So in a case where <clears throat> this example, and you're able to sell the building for seven hundred and fifty thousand. The, the, the property taxes gets paid first, then seven twenty is left to pay the mortgage, and the mortgage holder lo the thirty thousand dollars. Now, for this reason, almost every single bank and every single lender, when they make a loan, there are two things that even if you're paying your, there are two things that could cause them a damage, and the two things that could cause them a damage that they're not in first position, that could go be front of them, taxes, and for that reason, the banks escrow for taxes. So when you make your mortgage payment, we went through the mortgage calculators in the last session, you have a principal and interest payment. That's your payment based on the loan. But separately, if your tax bill is $60,000, the bank will take from you every single month $5,000 a month, so that when the tax, whether it's quarterly, yearly, however it's paid, they will pay, they'll have the $60,000 in the bank to make the payments. Because the only thing that could come in front of them <clears throat> is the mortgage payment. It's the, it's the payment of, of the tax. So they don't want to get... Go, go run into issues. They sell the building. Insurance, whatever property, make sure that the payment policy, the policy is there. Think about it, pay it out right. You can own the side for car insurance. On, on a typical building, and there's a home also. Banks will escrow, take money every month, but they make sure they have enough money and they control as the payment is made, the tax, the payment is made for insurance. Once I'm on this topic, the only, ex, the only legitimate exception that I know that a bank would waive for a borrower to pay the property insurance is if the borrower owns a lot of properties and he claims he has an umbrella policy that's tied to a bunch of different properties he has, where he pays one payment on behalf of a lot of properties. And sometimes a bank would say, okay, as long as you show me proof of payment, <clears throat> whenever the payment's supposed to be made, sometimes the bank would say, I want one year's payment and escrow just in case I ever find a problem. But usually, if there's ever gonna be a waiver, that's the logical way to go ahead and make the waiver. He doesn't mind putting it escrow, but you're not gonna pay it for me, I'm paying it anyway, so how do we deal with that? What's crazy about title insurance is that title insurance is the only insurance that's retro. Every other insurance in life is based on an unknown in the future, a known known if and an unknown when. Well, an unknown on a car insurance, unknown if you will need insurance. Will you ever get into a car accident? Unknown on life insurance, it's just a matter of when. Everybody's gonna die, the question is when. Yeah. The uh, uh, insurance company has to put away enough money to deal with the statistics of how it costs them and your rating and your health and all that to make those that car and put on the insurance. However, the title insurance, it's only insurance new realistically to come up in the future. We're talking about only going backwards. And if you're going backwards, then it's like it, it shouldn't cost as much as it costs. But you go, title insurance. It's public records. But what, what they actually do to get title insurance is they actually go to the courthouse and they check. If you want to make a claim on a building, the only way you can make a claim on a building is if you go to the court, record, record your lien. 
record it. So now, whoever makes, if you record the lien at 9.03 this morning, and someone comes in and does something at 9.08, you're, you're there first. They should have checked from 9.08 to 9.03. So how do they actually do title insurance? They, they send someone down to the city records, and they go back sometimes 30, 40, 50, 60, 100, 200 years. And they know that from the beginning of time until now, there's no issue. So the last time they updated was the last time they went to the city records. It's the last time in this building someone pulled title insurance, in theory, was March of 2014. When they send someone down today, they check, they confirm that it looks good from before that date, and they really look if anything was recorded from March 14th until today. That's how title insurance works. So one, a few points about title insurance. When somebody would go and, and take out a loan a couple of years ago, before the internet, to be able to check last minute, they can't actually check this morning if someone took out a more. So I checked yesterday. I go to the, I go, they actually go to the county clerk's office. They actually have someone who goes down to the county clerk's office and checks if something is filed. They go to the county clerk's office at 5 p.m. yesterday, and nothing is filed. So the bank scheduled a closing this morning. They know that I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the owner of this building. So what happens if I set up four closings the same morning? That's how a lot of fraud took place before the internet came around. <clears throat> I would, someone would own a building, Joe, and he would sell the building to four people on the same exact day. So Monday morning at nine o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock. He would jump from four different closings. And each sold for a million dollars, and he walked away with four million dollars. There's no way of stopping. So even then the insurance companies had what they call is called gap insurance. Like the gap insurance ensures in the last possible time it's possible to check until the actual minute of the closing date. So it's like a separate sub-insurance that goes in the title insurance. But ultimately, when you go out to a title company today and you ask them to insure your title for you, that's what they're insuring. That, that when, from the minute I close, nothing happened on this building. This person's actual owner. What's, what's the real concern that happens now in title insurance, which is not concern, happens every day, is that I take out a mortgage for, a, for $750. Five years later, my building is worth $1.2 million. I take out a 75% mortgage, $900,000. What happens to that 900,000? The title company checks and they see that five years earlier, a mortgage was given on this property for 750. They call up that mortgage lender and they say, I see you have a lien on the property for 750. What is the actual balance of that mortgage right now? It's five years later. They ask what's called a payoff letter. Give me a letter to tell me what the balance is right now. Not this minute, we said we were in interest is accrued daily. We're, we plan on closing on this and this date. What is the actual payoff? How much do I have to pay you that date that you will release the lien? So at the closing, what happens is we close for 900,000. The title company gets wired from the new bank the 900,000. They trust the new bank 900,000. The title company then goes ahead and wires 712,563 and 28 cents to the first lender. Now this, the lien is released. They can record the new lien for 900000 The difference they release to the borrower. And that's called a cash out refi. Because he refinanced his mortgage, his existing balance, and there's extra money there. He cashed out that extra money. He cashed out money in the process. So the person that's trusted the most, and that's why this is like the biggest thing you can do wrong, is if someone plays with escrow money and title and all this end of it, is because the whole system is based on trust. Is some lender lending $100 million and they're trusting the title company <clears throat> produces a piece of paper <clears throat> that says, I have a $100 million loan you're doing, the total liens to clean everything up. If you, Mr. Lender, want to be in position, first position, there's $91,500,000 worth of things that have to take place. $82 million to this lender. There's a claim over here. There's an expense over here. And we'll take care of it. So they take the $100 million. And every time they release people money, they get a sign off. If something happens later on, then the lawsuit goes first to the title company. You messed up. The lender would say, I lent, I lent that, go with the normal example going with, I lent that 900000 because you told me you're not going to release any of the money <clears throat> until you get a payoff. How did you release $712,000 to that first lender without getting proof that they really were the borrower? What happens if they get paid off seven twelve and then they come back? No, the balance really seven eighteen. That's fine. That's what you got title insurance for. So title insurance, but if you break it down, title insurance, again, is only on the past. Now, here's the crazy part about title insurance. Title insurance 
is regulated by the government. You are not allowed to negotiate the price. I'm a mortgage broker. I could charge a 1% fee. A borrower could tell me, I don't want to pay you $100,000 for this loan. I want to pay you $95,000. 90000 $90,000, $40,000. It's between myself and the borrower, whatever agreement I want to come to. Title insurance is regulated. They can't change the price of the title insurance. So when you do it a, a, a loan and there's a title insurance fee, that's what it is. It's not negotiable. What's crazy about it is as follows. The actual cost of insurance is about 15% of that price. So there's a company called Chicago. Three or four others. All the other, only four companies in the whole United States that insure title. I, I, there might be a few more, but I think there's only four of them. They actually, insurance. When you know a name of a company, <clears throat> you have a friend that works for an insurance, a title insurance company, he, he doesn't work for the actual company insuring. He works for the company doing all, a representative of that company that does all the work back and forth. They hold the money in their escrow account, they're the ones that support the payoff letter. But who actually provides the insurance? Some company out there, four of them. Those four companies only charge the actual cost they make is like a 15% of the premium. So you have a friend who has an entitled company, it's 85% is what his profit is, or towards his general overhead, paying his secretary or staff. In my office, someone sees those numbers, they negotiate my fee down. You can't negotiate. So that's what happens in the title. It's regulated. So the whole, that's why so many people are against the whole title industry, real estate owners. First of all, why, even if you want, for first, certain states, by the way, change it. Certain states, they let it, you can, be, you can negotiate. But New York, for example, it's not, you can't negotiate. This is the fee. And that's it. So, but the whole thing is crazy in general. Why it's so expensive to start with. It's all, and that's, when you go behind the scenes, you understand it. But this is the only insurance on the past. Someone actually had to make a mistake, an actual mistake, a high probability a mistake was made. Now an insurance company also gives insurance that what you're buying is yours. So take, for example, I think I'm selling my house. My house is a lot of 50 by 100, 100 by 200, an acre by an acre. Who said actually the lot on the piece of paper that was in the contract attached to it, I actually own? Maybe there's a sliver that's not mine. And that's also a title company confirms that what you're being sold actually down to the surveyor, all the, but again, if there's a mistake, you knew it, you made a clerical mistake. You didn't make a mistake that an unknown may happen, someone may die later on, you're giving insurance for that. You're doing it based on the past. So these are the insurance, how insurance works today, with technology, they actually even bring that insurance literally to that minute. That's why a lot of these, these frauds are gone. Because if someone's making a closing at nine o'clock, you could record it live. So they know the thing was recorded. I'm sure there's a gap of some period, but you know, not enough to pull off these, uh, these, these types of frauds that, that went on in the past. But that's what title insurance is. It's an important part of the puzzle. And you also want to make sure on title insurance, you're dealing with someone that if there's gonna be an issue later on, they, you want to deal with someone that didn't you know, play games internally. So once, this is the key part. You could buy a building, think everything is great, and find out the worst thing is, at a left field, someone knocks on the door and says, by the way, you owe me 50,000, I have a lien on the property, I have some. You have a problem, make sure that you're going with someone, that you're backed up, that they're actually covering on the, on the, on the title end of it. So previous lien, I mean, someone may lay claim to your property, title insurance protects you from such a claim. A title company runs a rigorous search and ultimately insures the property from later claims. In most states, Cost of insurance is regulated. Title companies compete by offering various gifts and perks to those use who this, those you to those that use the services. The regulation with this they're coming after, it's illegal to take money through the borrower to take any money back. So it's called a kickback, and this is very highly regulated. And therefore, they try to find that gray area where it's not called giving somebody back. So if you can't give somebody back, so in many cases, someone could say, they, the person will know that you have an interest in golf, you have an interest in, in a sports game, and then all of a sudden they'll take you to the play, to, 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 they'll take you to, you have the, when it comes to the Super Bowl, who's paying, you have a thing with who's paying for those private jets to pay $10,000 a person for the ticket of the seat, and then all those things, because if someone does a lot of title business, and they could say it's called entertainment, I mean, I'm paying out a client, there's nothing else to give the client back, so that you know you made millions of dollars in fees off this client, Who's paying for it? Not the actual end user, because if, if you gave an owner the choice and says, I can give you a check back for half a million dollars, or I can't give it for half a million dollars, so instead, I'll, I'll treat you and your family a private jet to what's called, you might as well take it, you don't have another choice. 
So what's called the cage, what's legal, what's not. So a lot of times people ask me, why didn't I go into the title of business? I don't want to go into a business regulated this way. At least I want to win business today in my business. I win business one of two ways. I win business as a blend of the value I provide and the price you can pay me. And it's a negotiation between me and the bar every time. I'm not going to get tapped on the shoulder by someone telling me that you weren't able to do and that you can't do. But that's a very regulated business. Who could get maybe a third party? Could get a license, could get this gift, that gift, a check to a charity, different things that people could do. But that's why how the whole thing works. That person making 85% is covering their own head. And that's how it's working from there. <clears throat> Section two, page 10. Diligent due diligence. And this is what I think the key part is the, I'm, I'm doubling up the word on diligent. You think you have a great deal, looks great on the surface. Now you gotta really put on the detective hat. Don't get emotionally involved in it. Be prepared any moment if you notice something's wrong, walk. Don't say, ah, I already have too much money invested. I put too much time in it. I already started selling it to people. If you notice there's a problem, walk. That's the toughest part that people have. But that's where the diligence comes in. At least, at least know what you're getting yourself into. So when something comes up, you could decide, can I work around it? Or is there really a problem that I'm not able to go ahead and fix? There are buyers and lenders that actually knock on doors and ask random tenants how much rent they pay, how long they've been living there. This is the way you're supposed to do it. Because at the end of the day, you, you, you were sent a rent roll. And the rent roll showed you apartment 1A, a certain person's name, and how much they're paying rent. Knock on the door random. And say, I'm looking at this building. By the way, how much is your rent? The person will answer you, my rent is whatever. If it matches up, if you do a bunch of apartments, you could assume the whole building's that way. If it starts a little bit off here and there, you know you can start running into problems. <coughs> That's one. We're living more in a digital world, so many people even have automatic, you know, you know, auto pay and different things. So obviously some of these due diligence measures are changing with technology. But the same measures, you want to check every single lender. I had lenders walk into a building. If you ever think about it, the guy tells you there's 52 units in the building. Maybe there's only 50. He made up two units to show you more income. I have, a, I have a, a, a banker that used to go into a building. He used to actually go in there by the meters downstairs and count how many meters there are. So you know how many units are in the building. And they matched it up to make sure it matched. Now, are things recorded public records <clears throat> where you have like, to check? You know, it shows how many units the building is. Yeah, but sometimes things could change. But not everybody checks everything. So when someone's buying a building, they check everything. Now, for the sometimes too much information is a problem. I believe when it comes to this, it's not too much information is a problem what to do with the information it could be a problem. But you want to be in the know about every single line item that's there. The problem today, different than a couple of years ago, even more so 20 years ago, that 20 years ago, like I said, people bought real estate for the bricks and mortar. They looked at this building today and said, you know something, based on the neighborhood, this is what it's worth. As income is worth, there was enough margin of error in the numbers. Today, you're buying a building where every nickel, every dollar you find in income, or you save in expenses, or God forbid the reverse, it gets increased in the expenses, but decreased in the income, changes your return. So if you have that, you can't afford it. You don't have much room for margin of error. You have to do much more due diligence. Because as it is, when the time you finish, something can come off that's wrong. One idea that I saw from a client a long time ago, and I advised to a lot of clients is, that when you go to contract, don't go to contract that I'm buying the building for 3400000 I'm buying the building, calculate what that building 3 million for, what cap rate it is based on the current NOI that you, you think you're buying. And what you'd rather agree to the seller is, I'm buying the building based on these expenses you showed me, which works out today to a seven cap. That's the number. If I find out later that is an expense that's missing, the NOI is, is lower, then I'm able to lower the price. If you went to contract at 3.4 million and you find something in the due diligence, the seller potentially can tell you, listen, I went to contract three, four. I don't care if you farm or income, don't farm or income, find the expenses, don't find the expenses. You don't pay me three, four, I could walk. And you could have went down the line, it wasn't in good faith. So sometimes you could sue for things, no matter in a normal case, there's no fraud. Just something came up, you wanna protect yourself. Since January, almost every large contract that I know that went into contract, the, the buyer and the seller made a deal and I'm buying the building for this price. However, my in, it's tied to the 10-year treasury bill. Every five basis points, every five ticks of the 10-year treasury bill up, I get the ability to reduce the price because I'm losing the money on my returns. 
Some sellers agree, some don't. But why should they fight about it later? If, they, if, if I know that I can't afford to pay your price, if the rates went up a quarter of a point, then why should I fight later when I have too much money up? If you can't agree to the concept now, let's just stop now. Let me go from there. Sometimes the seller would say, okay, fine. However, there's no I'm selling less than 3.3. Three. So I'll go with that idea with you. And then that's a negotiation, or at least a negotiating from strength, not from weakness, in the 11th hour. Go up and look, take a look at the roof, the exterior, and if possible, the boiler room. Now, if you don't know what you're looking at, then you're supposed to bring someone with you that you're probably are trusting anyway, that can look and give you advice about all these points. Do you need a new roof? Is there an issue where things are going? Through? Even though you might not know anything about a roof or boiler, you can detect if something is wrong. By looking at yourself, you might at least flag things yourself. So I tell people, even if you're going to trust somebody else, the right way to do it is also be there at the same time. So at least if you notice something, you could ask it. And there shouldn't be any part of your building that you don't know about. So don't set, I sent my guy and he told me A, B, and C. Be there yourself at that time. <clears throat> Ask other realtors in the area what cap rates are, an average price per square foot in the area. Don't just rely on what the seller's feeding you, especially if you're not familiar with the area. I say this first part is bullet point, even if you are familiar with the area. Always keep double checking. Someone's gonna give you a piece of intel that can help you in the process. Let's say the cap rates are here, but if rents are low, then go here. Listen to the discussion so you know how to apply it to the building that you're in. The more due diligence, the better off you're gonna be later on. Sometimes in a glossy pamphlet, a listed building at 10,000 square feet, and the actual space available to rent is only 8,000, as the other 2,000 are common area. This is a very, very, this is a key part over here. When you rent an apartment, the lingo of an apartment rentals today, almost universally throughout the country, is, this is what I charge a month rent. $1,500, $1,800, not about the square footage. It's not, oh, this apartment's slightly smaller than that apartment, so I should pay you less or more. This is the rent you pay. When it comes to commercial space, it's based on the actual square footage. And the, the lingo is a dollar amount per square foot. So I'm charging $18 a foot. If I measure the space I'm taking, I took 1,000 square feet. My rent is $18,000. 12 months is $1,500 a month. If we find out later on there's a mistake in the measuring, I'm going to go and adjust it accordingly. The, sometimes, and everything is negotiation, it's all what you're told. But again, same thing with the airlines. You know, it's, it's not really, you're not really comparing it because if one airline's not charging you an extra for the seat on top of the cost of the ticket and not charging you for carrier, not charging you for this, if you're actually going on a plane and you care to get a, a normal seat and you're bringing carrier and you're bringing luggage, show you apples and apples, but it doesn't go that way. The regulation's not there yet, okay? That's sometimes where there's good regulation. You don't get fooled as a consumer. Sometimes there's too much over-regulation. But over here, what happens is, is that a lot of times when I'm renting space, I would actually rent a thousand square feet. Take this example, this building. If I actually needed only 800 square feet. They'd actually charge me for a thousand square feet. And say there's, there's a loss factor of 20%. It's 20% of this building is the lobby and this and that. So therefore, everyone in the building has a chip in for it. So if you need 800 square feet, you're paying me for 1,000. So it's a little bit of a game. Because on one hand, why don't you just charge me $24 a foot? Let's say it's $20 a foot. Just charge me $24 a foot. Whatever the difference is from 800, doesn't work that way. Sometimes it does work that way. Sometimes old school owners did it that way. They had a rent per square foot. And all of a sudden, a new owner is able to throw in this idea that you pay for common area. So. There were certain times in New York City buildings, some of the creativity of some buildings, this is not now, because it's when once, the, once it became public information, everyone did it that day. But the, for some people went out, they bought a building that had 800,000 square feet. They also said we measure a building from outside brick to outside brick, not from inside brick to inside brick. So that difference just gave the building 5% more square footage or 10% more square footage. So the same exact building was able to rent now. They found an extra 100,000 square feet worth of, worth, of, worth of rentable square feet. Or 50,000, it's income straight to the bottom line. Some tenants hem and haw, yeah. But at the end of the day, they, you know, some people aren't leaving and it's all negotiation that happened. So sometimes they charge you for the, for, the, for the dead space. Sometimes they don't charge you. Now people can say, is it dishonest or not dishonest? Nothing is dishonest if you're told up front and that's the way it works. It's dishonest if you're told up front and that you're told that everyone else does it and it's not really true. But that's how lingo works in different businesses. So you have to be careful sometimes. When you're gonna go out and buy a building and say, oh, 10,000 square feet times $18, 
I know the expenses should cost me about this amount of foot. This is a good deal to buy. You get in there and you realize, no, 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 no. I only have 8,000 real square feet. So when I thought the market is 19 is when this the loss factor, it's called, is, is 18%. Your loss factor is 20. I can't get it. I'm going to lose out on that 2%. You have to make sure you're always comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Do your due diligence diligently and you won't walk into a trap. Never be, never be scared to ask questions about everything at, at any, any point. This part is more up the alley of almost anyone that's even that's new in a business. This, this is what you could have related to till now. You might not be a plumber, so you can't look at the plumbing of the building. You can't, you're not a roofer, you can't look at the roof of the building. You can't tell if the bricks are old, the bricks are good, if you need pointing and different things. When purchasing, a, a, when purchasing real estate, page 11, section two, when purchasing real estate, part of the legwork is researching the history of the property. I'll put it together at the next point, checking numbers. Always verify the numbers and projections you're assuming. Use local comps to help confirm. So go together. I showed you a rent roll before. And I had it, the income. One page had the income in the building, potential income, vacancy, list the expenses, and delivered an NOIT. But I only showed you one page, a, fr a snapshot of one time right now. You always want to get the history. Show me the last two years of expenses. So I can line it up and say, okay, 2015, these were the numbers, 2016, and current. And then go line by line and see if there's anything different and ask to understand every single difference. You may decide up to 5% is not significant unless it's a trend 5% more each year. What's going on? Is it going to continue going up? Is it trending downward? Well, you can say, no, I'm checking every single number out of the care. Check the history. So you just got to this point by, by the deal makes sense, the cash and cash could work, the cap rates could work, and you go home. But match the history to the current, the current at this point. Step two with that is checking the numbers. Actually go and they take a copy of every single bill. Landlords are taking copies of every, purchaser are taking copy of every single lease. See what the lease is. Now, obviously in apartments, you don't have to check every single lease as much. You want to spot check them. But if you have an office building, every detail makes a difference. What are the responsibilities of the landlord? What are the what ifs? What happens on the renewal? There's a lot of details to go in there. So when you go through this, you want to go out and checking on the numbers. You want to then verify. So you look on the surface, you're comfortable. You adjust it, NOI is no longer 72,000 that, in that example we were using the other day. It's 68,000, it's, it's 62,000, okay? <coughs> but now I want to check every single bill. Is every single bill that I have an accurate on every single bill? Is every single bill not accurate? And just make sure that it matches up and all said and done. There's something called a lease synopsis. Most leases are very, very thick. Not for residential, not for apartments, but for commercial, it's very, very thick. Because there's a million different things that could go wrong and who's responsible and whatnot. And who's what. A lease synopsis sums up the lease, the business points of the lease. So when, you, when I get a rent roll, it says, you know, you know, this and this office tenant is paying this amount of rent and the lease comes due in 2016 or 2021, we'll sum it up and say, by the way, yeah, but in every year there's a 3% increase. And every year is responsible to reimburse for this percent of the expenses. And situations like that take place. There's a company, Madison, Madison Specs, so I think, I don't know, the, one of the divisions, this is what they do. They will go through your leases and give you that review. So you have to review hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages worth of leases, times how many building, how many leases you have. And they'll put it through and they'll just deliver you, like, so to speak, a one or two page summary on every single lease. Many times through this process, you find information that really could work to your advantage. Sometimes it was an owner who forgot about a certain clause. That in year number 12 of the lease, if this and this, I could do dot, dot, dot. And it's been there for 20 years, right? Sometimes a buyer buys the property, he's buying it anyway. And that's the goal, he buys the property, he walks in and says, by the way, the last day here is you owe me. They find income in a lot of these cases a lot of times. That goes through here. So this due diligence helps you win the lottery sometimes, but for the most part, making sure there's nothing that you were missing on the other side of the coin. This is the key thing of checking out the numbers, verifying everything. You want somebody who is extremely detail-oriented doing this. So I tell someone as follows, I'll go off on a tangent on a point. In general, my general philosophy of hiring people, training people, working with people, 
is that every single person has strengths and weaknesses. And I say you want to play to your strengths and partner to your weaknesses. If you're good at one thing, look to become even better at that. Don't waste your time, your extra time, polishing things that you're not good at. You're not going to fix it. Don't waste your time. At least know what you're not good at and find yourself someone to go ahead and work with you that's good at that other point. The typical real estate buyer, typically, is not that detail-oriented and number-driven. There's a level of risk tolerance you're willing to take. There's a way, way of creativity. There's a, you're willing to, you can juggle the money, you can talk, you can, you can negotiate. You're typically not that detail-oriented, check line by line by line in history by history, typically. The stereotype. The mistake that they make many times is they hire someone similar to themselves, but also knows numbers. Or they say, that's not so important. Look, there's a million people that went to school that have jobs. How much are they making? Look how much I'm making as a real estate owner. It's not that important. I'll get someone. Why should I pay a high number for someone to do my numbers? I'll pay someone cheaper to go do my numbers. Anyone that knows numbers, they'll do my due diligence. The mistake is that you really want to partner with someone that's similar, that your biggest weakness, in this case, would be numbers, that's really that person's biggest strength. And if the market defines someone for that strength, you want to get, just like if you perceive yourself that you're the best in your class, get the best number person. And you overpay, because that's going to make a huge difference in your business. That numbers person will be able to show you different things on how to do things across your business platform. And imagine if you could have the numbers as great as you have your other strengths that you have, or whatever your strengths and weaknesses. And that's a lot of times I find people making a mistake. They don't have the right diligent person that understands it, sees things in a big enough picture, could advise them on risk reward. You have the right person, on the other hand, you're going to find yourself making less mistakes. When you find yourself getting a deal, it's only going to look better. And that's that difference where it goes out there. So if you look at most companies that are very successful, the most, the most partnerships is that you have someone who's, they have someone that there's a mutual respect and the two people together complement each other. And not necessarily are they, are they the same at all. And in a case like this, sometimes a person can't fathom hiring someone who's great at numbers with zero personality. It's, like how am I going to introduce the person? But you're not looking for the person to do anything else but do your numbers. So get the person whose skill set is what you're looking for, and that's their expertise. Focus on nothing else. Drive by assessment. Typically, you want to drive by the subject property to get a feel for the deal you're walking into. What they call a windshield appraisal. Just drive by, just like do you get comfortable in the neighborhood? Do you see a value here? There's some people who look specifically to buy the worst building in the neighborhood. Because they're buying the worst building in the neighborhood. They know they, they themselves just raise the bar of the neighborhood wherever they plan to go ahead and do to the building. Just in general, get a feeling. When someone tells you, oh, this building, it's great proximity to the train and watch. Park there, five o'clock, or six o'clock, when people are coming home. And see, is it really that easy from the train to the house? Is that the right side of the train? See, just get an eye what's going on there. You might be there and say, you know something? I thought it was good for the train, but I realized it's a much better location around the corner. And because it's officially around the corner, it's off the main street, it's a little bit cheaper, and really, it's better because I think it's better for a tenant. So maybe it doesn't have the same address as the other one. Who knows what you pick up? Now, we live in a world of something called redlining. Redlining is illegal. Redlining is when a bank will decide they're going to discriminate against a certain neighborhood. They don't want to lend in a certain neighborhood. And they could say it's totally illegal. They have to put the same criteria in every, every neighborhood they lend in. They can't pick and choose. Now, how do they get around it? It's not so much they get around it. They actually will do every single neighborhood. But the cap rates aren't dictated by the banks. So it's, it's, they'll lend in a weaker neighborhood, but by, ne by uh, 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 un let's say, un not as a desirable neighborhood for themselves. But don't forget the real estate won't be as worth as much. So they're not in the same risk position anyway. They'll underwrite it based on this history of that neighborhood. That neighborhood will probably have a higher vacancy, a higher turnover, higher collection loss, more repairs maintenance. That's typically what will go stereotyping with the neighborhood. So they will lend the money. Bottom line is for every dollar in cash flow, they'll give you 75% of the appraised value for that neighborhood. They're protected off. They're not going to give you the same dollar amount. But the other way is like a lot of times in the same token, well, I would say to someone, how do you describe the neighborhood if you want to be politically correct? And it's not about politically correct or not. And just like not you describing it, a full neighborhood and writing it off, just in general. How do you talk if you're safe, if you feel comfortable? How do you describe the situation that's like, I want to tell me an example. You drive to the building. You're thirsty. You have three choices. Would you get out of the car, walk to the corner, buy a drink, 
come back to the car, lean on the car, and drink it. Very safe neighborhood. You get out of the car, walk to the corner, come back, and drink it in your car. Mm -hmm. Would you get? Would you go out of your car and not get out of your car? Rough neighborhood. So it's not a, it's not about redlining this thing. This is just, just your own comfortability. And what I found over all the years is as follows: you will never be able to convince somebody to get comfortable when they're not comfortable, unless you get them to actually be there. So someone in their mind says, "I'm just not comfortable," and this is with anything in life. Comfort is an important part of the equation. And that's why there are certain people who buy real estate based on gut, and some people buy it based on numbers. Some people buy it based on both, and based on what they could do to rebrand an image. That's rebranding of an image. That is a stereotype. I'm nervous about this. Now it's, I'm, I, I personally don't understand, like I said a few times, why anyone buys a retail building. It makes no sense. It's only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. What are you doing? That people say, no, you know what you're talking about. There will always be a need for this type of Restaurants, or whatever. Okay, now look how many square feet there are on the, on your main shopping center. Are there enough people to eat at all those restaurants? And you're forgetting. There's something called Uber. It's Uber Eats. So who says everyone's coming into the restaurant? They can deliver and send it home. There's companies that are competing because they're losing their business. They're competing for your home, to be able to serve you more gourmet type meals at home. And even if there are, everyone wants to eat. You need restaurants, but how many restaurants do you need? And other people, you can argue that call. So some of this is, could be backed by numbers, and some of what I just said could be backed by gut. Some is backed by both. Some it's logic. People can make different decisions. Some people just make, well, listen, it's always been retail, it will always be retail. It doesn't work like that. There's many industries that totally disappeared over time, and this can be one of them. So when you're going out and, buy, and, and looking at this, you gotta look at the history of the deal. You gotta go drive by it, feel comfortable, and say to yourself, sometimes actually pick up the phone also and call those other buildings, what rents they're getting. See what vacancies those other buildings have. Check the reports to match it up and make your own assessment. And that's by trusting the hearsay of what other people say. Don't just go out and trust the public opinion. Consult with an appraiser or broker for his grasp on the deal on a specific purchase area. There's nuances in the, in the reason. Find out why other people aren't buying the deal. Doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it, but at least try to understand why so you can incorporate it in your thought process and business plan. Inquiries, this is the key. Ask many questions before you enter a deal may have a far off exit strategy. You're buying a deal, but one year off, two years off, 10 years off, 20 years off, and keeping it for life and for generations. I ask a lot of questions. Because the trajectory can be so far off, you make a mistake. It's like, okay, I made a mistake. I bought, I bought a stock, so it's not for me. I want to sell. How much damage could happen in a day? You're in this for a long time. You're spending a lot of money to get into it. Ask as many questions. Don't let someone stifle you from asking questions. Section 2.12. There are short-term and long-term tenants. Who benefits? So it depends what you're looking to accomplish on your building. If you think rents, if you think inflation is coming, that means rents are going to go up. You'd want to have short-term tenants. If, if you're a landlord, you'd rather have tenants only take five-year leases. Because you know, five years from now, your expenses are moving up. You want to be able to readjust your income to match your expenses. If you're a tenant, you'd rather a longer term lease. But on the other hand, maybe if you're a tenant, you might want to move around. You might need, you might need a, you, that's interesting. Oh. That's the beauty of having an app. Because I have an Android and an Apple phone to compare the two apps. Okay, anyway, so. If you're going out, if you're, the, if, you're the, if you're the landlord on a deal also, and a tenant, there's many reasons why you would want to be in one place for longer, shorter, up and down, left and right. There's no right or wrong answer. There's a concept what's right or wrong. Is that who wants more security for what part of the equation? But the typical negotiation tactic to meet somewhere in the middle is that the tenant will come into the building and the tenant would, be, the tenant would come into the building and the agreement would be to the landlord is, Listen, I need to be here for 20 years. I can't afford to move my practice. I can't afford, afford to move my store. My workers are here because this location is perfect for them. I can't afford to move. And I need the security if I'm gonna put a lot of money into my space that I'm here for a long time. There's a lot of moving parts. But the landlord says, but I don't wanna be stuck with expenses. So they'll agree that I'll pay the rent today, 
It'll be like a triple net lease or a net lease or a summer hybrid that will go off a base year. Listen, landlord, you're profitable today? I'll tell you what, I'll maintain your profits for the life of the lease. So every year your expense is now at $200,000 to run the building. Next year goes to 250. I will pay my share of the building expenses, that extra 50,000. So if I have half the building, my rent next year will be my rent plus 25,000. The following year it goes up another 10,000. My rent will be an additional $5,000 as reimbursement to, to you. The other side of it comes down to financing. Maybe the landlord and tenant don't really care about a five year, seven year, 10 year, Five year, five year loan, five year lease with an option to go for another five years to the tenant, to the landlord, the rent, the rent adjust. A lot of different variables could happen. Like another variable I'm saying just fast now is five plus five. In other words, the landlord, the tenant says, I need to be here for 20 years. The landlord says, but I don't know what the rents are gonna be. I don't be stuck, everyone laughing at me that I'm charging you $8 a foot because that's the market today. And really if the market's gonna be $42 a foot in five years from now, so the tenant can say, no problem, $5, five years. Every five years, we will appraise whatever the market rents are in the neighborhood, my rent will change. But I know that also, I don't wanna be stuck and in five years, you know that I can't leave because I put a lot of money in and the market rent is $30 a foot, you're gonna charge me 40 because you know I can't leave. Both wanna be protected. So that's the business side, left and right. The third component is financing. The financing component is, is and we'll get to some of these expenses on this session, the next session, is that the bank says, listen, if you only have a five-year tenant in here, I have to assume a very high chance they're gonna leave or a very low chance they're gonna leave or totally they're gonna leave. And therefore, that even though you have enough money to afford the mortgage today, but I think you have to put aside a few thousand dollars a month so for the five years comes due, you have enough money in an account to cover the cost to bring a new tenant in. The owner doesn't want to have to deal with that. So you might say, you know something, let me make a deal with the tenant for 10 years. So even though I have to put away money, but it's for 10 years away. So I have to put away half the money every single month because I have 10 years to save up the money for the blender. Let me go for 20 at least. And that becomes the added throw in is how is the lender gonna look at it? Now again, if I think inflation's coming, I'd rather put away that little reserve and have the luxury of my rent jumping in five years and dealing with that difference to go ahead and make a store. So I wanna to explain to you one very, very crucial part of this whole real estate business on the financial changes. It's a very important point. There's something called when you take a loan, a personal guarantee, which means I'm borrowing $750,000. You tell the lender, if God forbid something happens and you have to foreclose, you have the legalities that come even before foreclosure, but the concept of just paying it for illustration purposes, you have to foreclose. And the $700,000 you sell the building for and you lost 50,000, you could personally come to me, I'll write your check for that 50,000. That's how one part of the equation works, it's called a personal guarantee. Sometimes a lender makes a loan, no personal guarantee to you. There's no guarantee. I made 750, if it goes sour, I'll take the loss. Why would a lender do that? The lender does it simply because of competition. On an apartment building today, it's deemed very safe. So in order for one bank to win the business share, they went out to the marketplace and said, we'll do it without a personal guarantee. And he may lend without a personal guarantee. So therefore, almost every lender today, a multifamily lends without a personal guarantee. On an office space, all comes with recourse, personal guarantee. Shopping center, the personal guarantee. However, many of those lenders say, if you borrow only 65% of the value, I'm not so nervous. If you get a correction, I won't take a loss. Then I won't take a personal guarantee. But the starting point is a personal guarantee. A lender that works with personal guarantees, many times don't really care if you have a three-year lease, five-year lease, seven-year, 10-year lease. Because they trust you as a person that you're financially stable and sound. If there's a problem, you'll deal with it at that time. However, most of the larger transactions that go down, those shopping malls, are not personally guaranteed. When Wall Street did a loan, the CMBS did a loan, there's no, there's no personal guarantees there. So in that universe, it's all logic-based. That's what I'm gonna get through in the, in, in the sheet. In, 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 I think it's the next session. In that case, they really have to calculate. You would take a five-year lease and tell you, you have to put away a lot of reserves to make sure that every time there's an anniversary date, you have enough money to deal with all the potential scenarios. Yes, if in five years from now the tenant renews, I'll give you back the money you set aside and you start again. But we have to deal with it. There's no room to say, just trust me, there won't be a problem, the rents will be higher. No trust. It's like you're telling me, and if you're wrong, are you gonna write a check to me? No, so it's not called trust. 
Trust is when I can trust you because no matter what, you'll cover. Not trust me, it's a good idea. So I, the lender, should take money. So everyone watch a shark tank. Don't take advice from someone who doesn't have skin in the game. So the lender says, you want to put skin in the game? You want to guarantee me? So sometimes it's actually guarantees that are called springing guarantees. Where a tenant would say, I'll tell, a lender would say, I'll tell you what. I'm going to sign this lease here. I'll, I'll take a loan. It's not a recourse. But if this tenant doesn't renew, I'll be on the hook. Just don't make me reserve for it. Or they'll do something called a master lease. There's another level of creativity. They go to the bank and say to the bank, listen, I'm not prepared to guarantee the loan. Because I don't know if real estate's going to be worth a six cap or a 12 cap. Well, for those of you who didn't absorb cap rates yet, I don't know if the value of real estate is going to be less because people don't value real estate as much. And in real estate, people want to start making a very high return. So in order to buy my building, they have to pay me half the price. I don't want to be stuck that I, this building is worth a million dollars today and I borrow seven fifty because it's not worth a million dollars. It's worth only half a million. I just lost money and you come after me. But I'm very confident that I'll keep this. I have a store downstairs. I'm confident that there'll be a store there. I will sign for you a master lease for 20 years. The store's paying $8,000 a month rent. I will sign you a, ga- a lease right now, master lease that says, I am the tenant for the next 20 years on this spot. So if that actual store goes out, the bank shouldn't have an issue. If your issue lender is that the building's not gonna be worth a million dollars, then don't lend me the money because I'm telling you now I'm not signing personal to it. But you wanna make sure you can always have that $8,000 because you, you, you're comfortable to value. You wanna make sure you have enough cash flow to make the payments, that I'm willing to cover. So there's certain negotiations to get people comfortable. Again, that's why I like the business. It's about logic and creativity. If you could logically come up with a creative solution, usually you'll get it heard and listened to and get structured in. And that's these things go out there on all these points. So you have an anchor tenant, a tenant like ShopRite. Change the word ShopRite to a grocery, a grocery store. A grocery store is typically an anchor tenant. It's likely to attract other tenants to the property that want to be near a supermarket. <laughs> Visited by an abundance of people on a daily basis this is in addition to the fact that they may account for more than 50% of the leasable area. So an anchor tenant is who's an anchor. You take a, a ship, you throw an anchor over, and it holds it in place. What's keeping the center for sure happening? Usually that grocery store is about 50% of the space. Usually the grocery store pays enough rent to tell the landlord, I'll cover your taxes and insurance. So you don't have to worry about anything. Your profits will come from every store you rent on the side. It also gives the comfort that stores on the side. Again, yeah, this is beginning to change now with the internet, but most people go grocery shopping several times a week, at a minimum once a week. Now you may go several times a week, you may go to your grocery store once a week for your grocery shopping. You run to a convenience store here and out for odds and ends items. Well now with stores got smarter, they didn't want to lose to the convenience store, so they have like their store in the front, they have like a little area of the convenient type items so you can go in and out the hybrid stores. That's why they're set up that way, for that reason, not to lose you to someone else. But if you're always going to the grocery store, the odds are that's why there's a coffee shop, there's a cleaners, there's a nail salon, those types of stores along the side. Because if you're anyways going, those are not stores you get married to. Most people don't have, this is the nail salon store that I must use always. They have a preference to the person they go to if they can. A barber, they don't care. How they get to most, I'm anyway going shopping. It's convenience. I'm parking my car once. Do my grocery shopping, and once I'm here, there's typically a pizza shop there, takeout. So you're doing your Thursday shopping for the end of the week, or the beginning of the week, you're gonna buy pizza that same night while you're running out, that's the one night out you're gonna take it. That's why a lot of these stores are in the same places. When there was video stores, video stores were typically built in the same exact places. They were in the same, at the end of the shopping center. The same reason, it's that other stores, what are things that people will go to, once they're there, they'll pick that store. So they feed off each other. That's what the anchor tenant was. The credit tenant is a tenant with a high credit rating. From S&P, Standard & Poor's, uh, Moody's, these are places that rate the quality of a tenant. As an attractive tenant, as the owner feels secure, this tenant is here to stay through the life of the lease. Walgreens and CVS are known to be high credit and thus very desirable tenants. They are so desirable that they use this leverage to negotiate lease terms that are strongly in their favor. Is un- it is usually worthwhile to secure a long lease with such tenants, barring the risk of inflation. So, I have, I have a tenant who wants to sign a lease by me, wants to sign a 10-year lease. 
I don't know they're going to be in existence for 10 years. I'm the owner. Why in the world would I waste my time giving up all the perks of, of, of new rents and everything for a tenant? It might go out of business even. So I'm up to, I can only lose. So if you could check out that credit rating. It's like you have a rating, a credit score. They have a credit score. You don't have a little mom and pop grocery store that doesn't have a, a rating. Any public traded company has a rating. Now basically tell the landlord how strong this tenant is. So you take a tenant like Walgreens. Walgreens, you know, is not going to go out of business. They're so strong that they don't have an issue. So if you're going to lend, if you're going to, if you're going to be a landlord, you'd be willing to give them a deal. Say, so if you know something, would I rather the security of never thinking about the spot again, taking a little bit less rent, but locked in for the next 25 years, like a coupon cutter. Every month, I just get my check, like a coupon, and I take it. I could, you know, most Walgreens are triple net leases. They're the only spot on that, on, that, on that property. They they cover all the expenses, but they go along with 25 years. Here's your check, and that's it. They get a lower rent than if I rent me out to a regular store, but the landlord has the comfort of knowing, you know something? I just took a long-term loan to match my long-term lease, and I don't have to think about it for the rest of my life. That concept, that's a coupon. They get the difference. But even within a, within, a, within a shopping center, within a shopping mall, if you have a tenant that's a credit tenant, you'd be willing to take a longer term lease. Because when you come to me for a, lend, for a loan on this center, if you have a, a, a tenant that's a credit, and the tenant has a long lease, you're able to actually negotiate the vacancy factor to zero for that spot. So you could sometimes come to, I could come to a lender sometimes and say, the building is a 5% vacancy but I have one tenant in the building that's here for 20 years, a credit tenant. So there's no vacancy here. So take, this income is, this is a million dollars in income, this, this tenant's paying 100,000. Take only 5% of the 900,000. Only do 40. Go for me and say, $45,000 is my vacancy factor. I just found $5,000 in extra cash flow available to borrow more money. So that's how these deals work. They weren't as attractive years ago when there wasn't such sophistication with finance. It wasn't really advantage to a landlord. Very nice to your Walgreens, but so why should I take less if you have 20 years? I think it'll be a 20 years anyway. And if not, you all take it to someone else. But since the whole game is finance, the landlord's saying is if I take you as a tenant, today I can borrow money against that lease. I have extra money, gives a better return. I can borrow my building. It all comes together at the same exact time. A mom and pop store. While well, seemingly they could be a far cry from Walmart, mom and pop stores have their own merits as well. The local people may have stronger lo- allegiances to, the, to this business and are steadily patronizing. It is important to analyze their financial statements before signing a long lease with a business of this sort. There are some stores in a community, a sub-community that people love. And sometimes, if you really look at it, before you, know, you talk about kosher, it used to be that in a community that had kosher, you had to have kosher stores for kosher. And some of the larger chains realized we're losing a certain part of their community because they don't have a kosher section. They open up kosher sections in stores. That's why you could be surprised going throughout the country in different markets. That you'd be surprised you walk into a regular national chain and they could have a section, a kosher section. Or if whatever, whatever the community is, they could have a section that's catered specifically to that community and they customize it for that reason to be able to balance off. So they want to they wanna win the market share from the local community and they could typically be cheaper because they're buying in a much bigger bulk as opposed to the local stores are able to go in and buy it. But here's a key thing in credit mom and pop as an owner. Can't tell you necessarily it works like this for a bank, for a lender, but it works for sure as an owner. If I have a credit tenant in ShopRite now, and I have another tenant there, it's a mom and pop local store, same location. I have a choice of who to take as a tenant. I said before that when it comes to the rents of commercial, they talk in the lingo of, of per square foot, rent per square foot, expense per square foot, reimbursement per square foot, that's the lingo. The same token when it comes to retail, it's sales per square foot. And it's typically recorded. So you could find out what are the sales of this location? When you find out that one drugstore chain is buying another drugstore chain, the first thing that every single landlord thing looks at what are the sales per square foot on my store? Will the new buyer pick me or pick the other store? Are they gonna close one of them down? Who's in trouble when the lease ends? Me or the other one? When a lender makes a loan, they check what are the sales per square foot for this grocery. Here is a industry 
average, what, a sale, what should be average, what's called good. Is a break even? Is a report of, is this above average, is a better store or not? When a retail, when a store decides to open, they did research and they realized that how much, what are the sales per square foot? Let's say a grocery is supposed to do 400 sales, $400 per square foot. That means they take the annual sales divided by the square footage and say a store needs $400 a square foot in order to break even. If there's a store doing $800 a foot, that store is making a killing. There's usually gonna be competition coming to that store. So there's not private, when it's privately held, no one knows what sales they're doing. So there's a, there's a store before a bunch of new stores in the community I live in, in Lakewood. There was, a, there was a store here, a kosher store, that their sales per square foot were like triple the national average. And there's a reason why, so when, when it came to lend the money at a bank, and a bank saw their sales per square foot, gave them a better rate term and deal to the ShopRite type store. Because the ShopRite may have a brand name, but their sales are way lower. That once you have a location that's able to generate over $1,000 a foot, any store will take that location after. So take the example which all of you can relate to nationwide. You have a pharmacy, a no-name pharmacy in your corner. That pharmacy, if they have strong sales, the minute that pharmacy would want to close down or, or the lease comes due, any Walgreens will take that spot because they focus on the sales per square foot. They want to take over that location. So even though it, we're, we're trained in the word of, of, of credit, oh, there's a credit tenant, more important than a credit tenant is, is the sales that go on for that actual tenant in the store. One last point, we'll end with this, is that on hotels, you know, part of what you have to do is be connected to, to a, 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 a better system. So you can have a great hotel, but if you're not on travel, you know, the travel sites and hotels.com and all these things, you can't get, you can't get, you're not going to be able to keep getting your exposure. So sometimes somebody look in this pharmacy and say, how are they getting everything? If they're not technologically attached to all the better systems out there, by virtue, they're going to lose the subscriptions. Because if you go to the doctor and the doctor has on his iPad, okay, which pharmacy are you at? He says, can you do me a favor? If it doesn't make a difference to you, they're not connected here. Can you mind going to the other one? How many of you really care which pharmacy you go to? That difference can start altering the landscape as well. So it's the sales per square foot takes the, takes the precedent over everything else. But if you're a financial institution, you're lending money, you have to say, I lent to a credit tenant. But as an owner, most owners would rather take a strong tenant with sales per square foot and just a just national name just for the purpose of a national name. Who brings foot traffic helps the rest of the center.